Um, the others are Reverend Dr. Eric Bacon, who you will be seeing later, who will be giving the minister's prayer, and Reverend Roberta Howie, who is actually on vacation right now. She's flown off to Europe, um, where she'll be going Paris, Amsterdam, and Berlin, and she's promised to send us a few um, video missives from uh, a very busy continent as Ukrainian refugees flow into uh, those countries. So. Uh, our thoughts are with Roberta, and we look forward to hearing her perspectives. It's still Lent, and that's why I'm dressed in purple, and so are members of the choir. Uh, but it's also the day of the uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade in Toronto, and it was St. Patrick's Day on March 17th, so today's colors will be both purple and green. Um, I'll be talking about St. Patrick's Day. Uh, yeah, Eric's wearing a green tie, as you'll see later. Um, I'll be talking about uh, the, the story of St. Patrick during children's time. And uh, otherwise, we're gonna be talking about purpley things, like what's the meaning of sin and why do we talk so much about sin in Lent? And is there hope in talking about sin? So lots of interesting things happening today. Um, Paul Winkleman's our music director, interim music director, is off on a sort of working vacation out in BC. So uh, thank you very much for Kimberly Briggs for taking over leading the choir, um, and for Keith for taking over uh, in the in Paul's position as baritone. And so if you would like to um, send your children off to Sunday school, we have that at, uh, at 11 o'clock, and just ask Allison for the Zoom code and she'll set you up. And if you would like closed captioning, that's also possible. Just click on the CC on, your, on the bottom of your screen. So now. Let's get into worship by taking two deep breaths. So get yourself comfortable wherever you're sitting. And one. And let it out. And another one. And let it out. And now let's sing our first hymn. And for those of you here, uh, we met this week talking about the rules. And you may sing as long as you keep your masks on. So... Please feel free to open it up. And you may stand, in fact. Um, the lyrics will be on, uh, on the screens. So. Thank you. 
masks and microphones do not go together. I look forward to being able to lose these things at some point. So now, friends, I invite you to just relax and realize that, you know, our symbol in this faith is the cross. The cross is vertical as well as horizontal. We come together on Sunday morning so that we can commune with God, but also so we can commune with each other. The cross was a very well-chosen symbol. It took a while for Christians to get there. At first it was the fish, but it evolved into the cross. And so now I invite you to get up, if you're here in person, and to share the peace of Christ with each other, because we are here to share the love which God sends us and spread it out. The peace of Christ be with you. So um, I want to talk to the kids. Uh, we are in, actually, Josh, would you mind sitting there? Excellent. <laughs> Josh is very tall, and he was right in camera four's way. So <laughs> we're learning, folks. <laughs> it's different doing this with people in the room. So kids, I want to talk to you today about something which you probably experienced on Thursday, which was St. Patrick's Day. You may have been told at school to, you know, get dressed up in green. And today, after church, um, downtown in Toronto, there'll be the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And why do people talk about St. Patrick? Well, St. Patrick's is a day for all things Irish, and uh, to help with this, uh, it, it's good to know where Ireland is. So here's a map of where Ireland is. It's right next to England. Um, and Ireland's a very green place. If you ever fly over Ireland or you go there, you'll see that there's just rolling green hills everywhere. They have a very temperate climate there, which uh, keeps the ground very green. Lots and lots of grassy pasture. And in some places, uh, everybody gets dressed up in green, and uh, green is sort of the color of the day. So thank you, Dennis, for turning me green. <laughs> I'm not feeling unwell. I'm just trying to talk about St. Patrick. And, you know, there's even cities that on St. Patrick's Day on Thursday poured green dye into their rivers. Chicago did that. This is what the, Chicago, or the river in Chicago looked like on Thursday. Um, so green is the color of the day. And people have a lot of fun on St. Patrick's Day. They go out drinking, they go to pubs, uh, they have corned beef and cabbage, and people celebrate all things Irish. But it is named after St. Patrick. So who is St. Patrick? That doesn't get talked about as much in school, so I wanted to tell you, because, well, he was one of us. He was a Christian. And St. Patrick lived, uh, he was born around 300 years after Jesus died, so a long, long time ago at a time when the Roman Empire was just starting to crumble and fall. And he grew up in England, in southern England, and he grew up in a village and his grandfather had been a priest and his father was a deacon, which meant that he taught Christianity to the people. And one day, Patrick, when he was 16 years old, was just minding his own business in the village, when suddenly some raiders from Ireland came. And they came into his village, they beat people up, and they stole people who they wanted to enslave. And I, uh, Saint, and Patrick was one of those people. So 16-year-old boy, not much older than you guys, hauled off onto a ship and kidnapped and taken across the waters to Ireland. And here in Ireland, for the next six years, he was enslaved. Um, someone had bought him and had said, okay, from now on, I don't care what you want to do, you do what I tell you to do, and that is to take care of my sheep. So he spent day in, day out, outside with the sheep, never knowing if he was going to see his parents again, never knowing if he was going to go back to England, just stuck in Ireland. And Ireland at this time was not a Christian nation. There had been a few Christians there before, but it hadn't taken root yet. But Patrick, having grown up in a Christian household all alone, on these fields in all forms of weather decided to talk to God and he wrote a bio, an autobiography later and he said for six years he talked to God and he prayed to God over and over again and God became his only comfort and he felt himself being filled with the Spirit of God and knowing that even though he was alone with the sheep on these hills he wasn't completely alone God was with him and then one day he had a dream that God told him there is a ship on the coast that you could escape on. Wrong slide, Dennis, actually. 
<laughs> we'll get to that one. Um, there's a ship that you can escape on, so get there. So Patrick abandoned his sheep and he ran down and he said it was about 200 miles away, which is a long way. It took him many days to run down to the coast and he managed to convince the people on the ship to take him with them. So he escaped slavery and it's unclear where they landed. It was either England or France. But Patrick decided that um, having spent so much time with God alone up on those, on those hills, he wanted to learn more about being a Christian. So he ended up going to France and he lived in a monastery and he became a priest. And while, and he eventually got back to his parents, so there was a reunite, they were reunited, which was nice. But then something funny happened. One night, Patrick had another dream and he dreamt that someone from Ireland called uh, Victoria had come to him with arms full of letters, more than he could carry. And these letters were people from Ireland saying, please come back, bring us the faith that you have. And Patrick woke up and he went, God wants me to go back to Ireland, the place where they enslaved me, where they've enslaved my neighbors, where people go to be killed. That's where God wants me to go. And he decided to do it. He could realize, he saw that Ireland needed the love of God. Slavery was no way, a way to live, bad for the slave owners and the slaves themselves. So he accepted the challenge. He was promoted to bishop, and he and a bunch of other Christians got on a boat, and they went over to Ireland. And you know what? It worked. Ireland wasn't so hard to convert to Christianity. Many aspects of Christianity seemed familiar to them. They already had a sense of the Trinity, so the idea of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit kind of made sense to them already. And Patrick went from town to town to town telling people about Jesus and telling them that every single person matters, that even these people who you've enslaved, they are full human beings. And of course, that's a message the slaves wanted to hear. And so people started gathering around Patrick and he set up all sorts of churches and monasteries all over Ireland. And eventually, Patrick's life came to an end. He died of old age on March 17th, which is why we celebrate his life on March 17th. But by, making, by helping Ireland become a Christian nation, the Irish actually did a big thing for civilization. In time, the Roman Empire fell apart. So the whole school system in Europe fell apart. And the only places that were still reading and writing and, and copying out texts as they decayed were the monasteries. And around the ninth century, the Vikings came down and they started raiding all those monasteries and killing people and setting them on fire, but they didn't reach Ireland. And there's a great book by Thomas Cahill about this, how the Irish saved civilization. And it was the Irish monasteries that actually preserved a lot of the texts of the Greeks and the Romans, as well as the early Christian texts, which we now rely on as part of our Western heritage. So St. Patrick did the world a great favor by taking Christianity to Ireland. So kids, the next time someone says, let's celebrate St. Patrick's Day, now you know a little bit more about why we celebrate St. Patrick's Day. It's not just because it's fun to be with the Irish or to drink green beer or to dress up in green clothes. It's also because God's love came to an island and changed the whole world in the process. So now from Janet McLean as she reads today's scripture. Repent or perish. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. The parable of the barren fig tree. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the vine dresser, see here, 
For three years, I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? The vine dresser replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Thank you, Janet. What is sin? That's the question that today's scripture reading is wrestling with. We hear Jan Jesus answering questions from a group of Jews who are around him who say, hey, they assume that these bad things that happened to these folks must have happened because they were sinning. Back then it was normal to think that God punished people for being sinners, so if something unusual like a tower falling down on 16 people happened, well, that must be God, the hand of God, just deciding those people need to be punished for their sins. Or, in a strange sort of story, which there's no other historical record of, um, Pilate somehow mixing the blood of some Galileans in with their sacrifices. Again, you know, those sacrifices wouldn't work anymore since they'd been polluted with uh, human blood, so these people must have died in a state of sin. So the people who are talking to Jesus are hoping that he's going to be able to give them some insight as to what kind of sin these people were guilty of. But as often happens, Jesus turns this into a teaching moment. He turns the question back around and he says, actually, God's not an assassin. God doesn't do that. Rather, if you don't repent of your sins, the same thing will happen to you. You will die in a sinning state. But of course, that just raises the question of, oh, geez, well, if normal people are likely to die the same kind of fate, what is sin anyway? Well, we need to unpack this a little bit because our ideas of sin have changed a lot over the years. Back then, in Christ's day, if you were an Orthodox Jew, which were, would count everybody he was talking to, they believed that there were 613 commandments in the Hebrew Scriptures that you had to follow. So 613 rules you had to follow. And they would, um, they ranged from seemingly benign things like eating shellfish to when it was safe to have sex after childbirth to, of course, bigger things like murder and theft. When there's 613 things that you've got to do, that's 613 things you can get wrong. And as a result, everybody was getting something wrong all the time. That was inevitable. Some people would sin on purpose, but other people just sin by mistake. And so the answer was to go to the temple and offer sacrifices so that you could wipe the slate clean over and over again. But when Jesus speaks of sin, right, he doesn't talk about it in that sense. He sort of ups the ante, and he says, actually, sin is something which happens in your head, not just what you do in the world. And he famously said, if you even think about having adultery with another woman, then you are sinning already. Or if you're angry at someone, that is one step closer to committing murder, so that's a sin too. This dichotomy between an act of sin and a mental one is interesting and, and something which we all struggle with. And so let's take a modern example. Uh, traffic laws. Down, downtown at the Gardner Expressway, the speed limit is 90 kilometers an hour for the spot that's, you know, right by all the big towering condos. During rush hour, you're lucky if you reach anywhere near 90 kilometers an hour, right? <laughs> you could be wishing that you were reaching 90 kilometers an hour. But on the, clear, on the clear times, when it's not rush hour, most people go more than 90 kilometers an hour, right? I don't think that too many people feel bad about that. They don't go home going, oh, geez, I broke the speed limit today. It's just not something that ties us up in knots. We don't experience mental anguish from breaking that kind of rule. Right? We can see everybody else is doing it. There doesn't seem to be any harm, so it's fine. Right? So sin is not simply breaking a rule. If it were, then we would feel that traffic law violations were sins, and we don't, and for good reason. If a person has an affair during a marriage, however, that sounds more sinful. 
It clearly prohibits, it's clearly prohibited in the Ten Commandments. It's also a violation of most people's wedding vows. An affair is a broken promise. It's a form of deception, a deep rupturing of a relationship. And it's also something that people often will fantasize about doing before they do it, right? I mean, people will think about having an affair and then start the affair. So it's both an act and a state of mind. And most of all, it feels sinful. And in fact, that may even be part of its attraction, <laughs> right? Some people like the fact that it's transgressive. That's what gives it its frisson, its kind of excitement. A thrill that comes from breaking the rules. Murder, theft, adultery. These acts are described as sin because they're a form of violation, the breaking of a relationship. Murder severs the living person's relationship with the entire world since they're no longer alive. An affair, well, that's severing a relationship with the person they pledge themselves to. Racism prevents individuals from having the right, the proper kind of relationships, which they should have by dint of being a human being. There's some things they can do and some things they can't do. There's some relationships they can have and some that they can't have. And that's the sin of racism and that it, it limits the sorts of relationships people can have. Lying is also considered a sin. But, you know, many of us tell little white lies, right? We tell uh, lies to protect somebody else. So, for instance, if someone says, do I look overweight in these pants? There's only one right answer, and it may not be true, <laughs> right? And so, usually, if you're wise, <laughs> you will say that one right answer, even if it's not actually true. And that we all know in some sort of deep sense that it's more important to maintain the relationship than it is to be accurate. And it's kind of the exception that proves the rule. When we're talking about sin, we're talking about relationships and trying to preserve a relationship, and sin gets in the way of that. Now, this, of course, begs the question, why would anyone want to sin at all? Many sins are imagined long before they're committed. And Christ warns us that we're already sinning when we contemplate these sinful acts. Now think about it. Is it healthy to be lying in bed next to your partner thinking about having sex with somebody else? Is that a healthy state of mind to be in? Or to be driving and so mad that you wish somebody else was dead? Or to think about different ways to cheat on your taxes or to steal someone else's property? In Greek, the word for sin is uh, a word that suggests missing a target, as though you're using a bow and arrow and you're shooting at a target, but you miss the bullseye. It means to be off-center. Not to be dirty or disgusting, but just to sort of be off-center. In Buddhism, there's a slightly different metaphor. The Buddha talked about um, suffering as coming from people being in a spot which is like, imagine yourself as a wheel. The axle should be right in, in the middle of the wheel, but sinful suffering comes from when the axle is actually off to one side of the wheel, so that the wheel goes like this. It's off kilter. Both of these metaphors are ways of saying that sin is not just about breaking rules, but, be, but being out of balance, missing the mark, lurching your way through life. Most sins start in the mind, and they have a way of souring our view of life. We imagine sinful acts before we do them because we feel deep down that we don't have enough. There's a lack inside of us that which we imagine if we filled, if we could just have that affair or teach that person a lesson, take that stuff or have more money, then we would feel better inside. That would solve an internal problem. Sinful thoughts and desires are a symptom of an emptiness, a sense of emptiness and dissatisfaction with who we are right now. 
We may resent what someone else has because if we had that, we would feel re-centered and fulfilled. That's what goes on in our heads. Yet that sense that our internal state can be fixed by taking something from someone else is a dangerous illusion. There are very few murderers who feel at peace after they murder someone. Jails are not full of mindful murderers who walk through their days feeling great. That's not how murder works. Inner peace doesn't come from actually enacting the sinful act. Because the problem was never just outside, it was inside too. And that inner hurt, that inner emptiness or sense of lack can't be solved by changing someone else or taking something. Because we were the problem. It was that sense of lack inside us that was the problem. Changing the world outside of you doesn't fix it. But unfortunately, when we discover that, you know, we, we do the sinful act and we still feel empty inside, often we don't realize that we have an inner problem. Instead, what we do is we just go sin some more, hoping that the next time we take something from someone, or maybe the next affair, or the next lie, that will actually solve that sense of inner lack. So it's like, you know, there's, you never feel satisfied after one potato chip, right? You just keep eating them, hoping to get that sense of fulfillment. Sin is like that too. In today's scripture reading, Jesus tells a parable about sin using the example of a barren fig tree. A vineyard owner notices that there's a fig tree in his vineyard which hasn't borne fruit for three years. And he says to the vine dresser, hey, maybe we should just chop down this tree. It's useless. And the vine dresser says, no, 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 let's, let's wait. Let's give it another year. But uh, let me dig a trench around it and put some fertilizer in. And let's see if it bears fruit next year. Jesus tells this parable to people who have been asking him, hey, did that tower fall down on those people because they were sinners? So they expect the vineyard owner, being like God, to say, hey, that tree's not producing any fruit, let's chop it down. But Jesus introduces another aspect of God, which is God's merciful aspect. And that's, that's the aspect of God that says, no, let's wait. In our day and age, we tend to think that we can solve all of our problems. I am enough, the saying goes. It's interesting that in this parable, the vine dresser doesn't say, let's just give the fig tree another year and see what happens. That would be, the fig tree is enough. It can solve its own problems. It will fix itself. Just give it some time. Instead, the vine dresser says, no, let's dig a trench around it and put some fertilizer in. Why does he do that? One of the things I've been teaching people in my Bible for Busy People classes is that when you hear a parable, there's always one detail which is not quite right. And this is your clue that this story isn't just about a vineyard owner and a gardener, but it's about something else. And here, the clue is, the text says very clearly that it's a vine dresser. Vine dressers, what's a vine dresser? Vine dressers are the people who walk around dressing the vines, like clipping them, clipping them back, cutting back branches so that they'll be more fertile. Probably, you know, every year if you've got rose plants, you used to, you know, cut back uh, the branches so that they'll bloom more, uh, more uh, fulsomely. That's what vine dressers do. They go around trimming the branches. But note, in this parable, Jesus has the vine dresser not say, I'm going to trim the branches, but rather I'm going to dig down around the roots. I'm going to put fertilizer down on the ground in a trench around those roots. This is Jesus' way of saying the problem isn't with what the tree is going to produce, sin or not sin. The problem is deep down. The problem is at the roots. So Jesus is saying if you want to understand sin, people, you got to get to the roots. And the roots, of course, is what's happening in here and in here. Sin is what happens when your inner being feels barren and infertile. Jesus chooses an image of infertility to talk about sin. 
when you feel that you're starved of something that you need. The parable presents Jesus as the helpful vine dresser who wants to feed your soul so that emptiness will go away. And to do this, he goes to the roots of your being and encourages us to look inside, to ask ourselves, where are we hungry? Where do we feel incomplete? What seems barren inside of us? Then he provides a promise. This story is saying that God does not want you to fail. God's not looking for barren trees to chop down because God loves chopping down trees. On the contrary, God wants you to thrive. God's not interested in how many people God can throw into some hell afterwards. I don't think hell exists, but like in these stories, hell is presented as a place, to, as a warning for us. God wants us to thrive. That's why this story is not about chopping down that tree, but giving it another year and feeding it so that it can thrive. God offers you a love which you may not think that you deserve. A love and care which can feed your roots, which can bring you back to life again, even when you feel dried up inside. And in fact, your desire to sin, that sense of feeling not enough, may be because you're blind to all the blessings around you. Often, you know, the last thing someone wants to hear when they're thinking about having an affair is, you know, you should believe in God more. That doesn't seem relevant at all. Those two dots don't connect, right? But for the person who wants to have an affair, they've got a relationship that's not working. They don't know that the next relationship is going to work better. What if they're bringing all of their problems to the next relationship? Now, there's no magic wand in these things. The next person isn't a magic pill that's going to solve everything. You've got to sort out your own stuff. So how do you feel God's love, that sense of not being alone? You know, Patrick was on the hill, totally alone, and he found God. Well, we're surrounded by people. How do we find love? Well, you know, in some ways it's pretty simple. You just ask. That's what prayer is. You say, hey, God, are you up there? I am not happy in this relationship. I'm not happy in this job. I'm not happy at school. I'm not happy with X. Could you help me out here, please? Provide a little bit of guidance, a little bit of perspective. The second part of it, and this is a key part of prayer, is that we're encouraged to notice the things which are around us, even the smallest things that we can be grateful for. Trying to give thanks for simple things. Remind yourself that your life is not as empty as it seems. Your job may not be working out, but your kids are great. Your relationship may not be working out, but you've still got lots of good friends and you've got an amazing garden or you love going to the cottage or you're part of a book group that really feeds you. It's not that any one of those things is your salvation. It's not. It's that the positive thinking, which comes from being grateful, provides a wider perspective so that you can see options which are blind, which you're not able to see when you're just thinking negatively. It's like putting fertilizer around your roots so that you can start to have the sap of positivity flowing through you again. As you realize that your cup is always more than half full, and it is, right? We don't live in Ukraine. We're not living in Mariupol. Things could be far, 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 far worse. We have all won the lottery just by virtue of living in this city. So if you can take a more positive outlook and say, okay, this part of my life's a big problem, but these parts are actually pretty amazing, that will actually give you the capacity to deal with this part better. It sounds too good to be true, but there's all sorts of science to back this up. People who feel optimistic recover from short-term illnesses quicker than those who are pessimistic. Optimists also, on average, live longer than pessimists. Jesus is encouraging his followers to realize that God is always there feeding your roots, giving you more time to bear fruit. 
The trick is, will you notice? And what about other people who sin then? Well, you know, they are the same as us. That's Jesus' point, you know. What, why did that tower fall on those sinners? And Jesus says, well, actually, <laughs> I don't need to talk about them. I want to talk about you because we're all the same in this. When other people do hurtful things to us, it isn't really about us. It was always about them. They're trying to work out their own inner drama by taking it out on you. It's not about you. It's about them. They're trying to fix an inner hurt, a sense of emptiness. But God does not want to give up on them, and he doesn't want you to give up on them either. God is rooting for them, as it were. God, the vine dresser, wants to give them another chance to bear fruit, to stop sinning. So we're encouraged to see our fellow sinners in this world as people just like us, as a tree with promise, one worth waiting for. How many people have you known in your life who said, you know what, you were the only person who stuck by me during that. You were the only one who believed in me. Jail is full of people who feel bad about what they did. The hot-headed kid who killed someone in passion in a bar fight when they're 23, by the time that guy's 45, he's not looking for another bar fight. All the passions and stuff which were going when he was 23 are long gone. He's just a regular guy now, but he's stuck in jail. People do change. Sometimes God is the only one who believes in you. But it helps if others do too, especially when times are hard. For the deep truth about sin is that it's not a permanent state. God didn't give up on that tree. And God doesn't want to give up on you either. Sin is not a brand or a label that we're stuck with for the rest of our lives. It's a state of the soul that can change. With time, with love applied to the roots. That love is something that we all deserve. Especially when we are making mistakes. And that is good news. Amen.
Let us pray. Loving God, source of our being and of our sometimes fragile faith, we come with thankful hearts for the freedom to gather in person or remotely as a community of faith to share in worship. For the season of Lent that offers us a time to discern our inner lives, which often seek direction and clarity. For the longer days, which hint of the coming of spring and rebirth after the cold of winter. For the love of family and other life-giving relationships. For the many blessings which contribute to our well-being, health, and happiness and for the call to discipleship that invites us to follow the way of Jesus in our living and our doing, the very essence of why we call ourselves Christians. We are truly blessed. But this morning, we are mindful that this largesse of blessings is overshadowed by our deep concern and compassion for the people of Ukraine, a free country that is being destroyed as we speak in an unprovoked attack. The images on our screens show us unimaginable cruelty, loss of life, and circumstances we find hard to comprehend. Rows of empty strollers as symbols of the innocent children killed in bombings and crossfire. A man weeps over the body of his mother. A woman ready to give birth is carried on a stretcher from a bombed maternity hospital and who later dies as well as her child. Fear and confusion is evident in the faces of the elderly. Millions have fled the country to find safety and refuge, and we are grateful to those neighboring countries who are offering a welcome and the necessities of life. Other courageous citizens remain in Ukraine to assist the military in defending their country and freedom. <clears throat> Words fail us as we try to language the plight of a peace-loving people. Loving, yet mysterious God, it is in the complexity of our world, its inequities, cruelty, injustice, and brokenness that we sometimes find it hard to locate or experience your existence. And so it is, in our times of skepticism, doubt, and questioning that we seek to find a measure of faith and hope to be your people, the body of Christ in the world. It is from the depths of our being that we offer up our prayers for the people of Ukraine, not from a wish or ask list, but with genuine heartfelt compassion and with as much understanding as is possible. May the day come when the world accepts that war is futile and that political posturing and greed will never bring the precious gift of peace for all people. Help us, O oh God, to never let go of that hope. Let us pray and pause for our world. Turning to our own community, let us pray for those who are ill, receiving treatment, experiencing loneliness, concern for self or others, those dealing with fractured and broken relationships or grieving the loss of a loved one. 
May they sense God's grace and presence. Let us pause to remember and pray for our community. Our prayer is offered in the name of Jesus, who walked this earthly journey and whose very ministry was with the poor and oppressed. Let us follow his example. However small and insignificant we feel our part may be, the need to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God remains for each one of us our very calling. Let us pray for the courage to keep these imperatives in focus as we meet the challenges, confusion, and uncertainties of this life, always ready to notice and willing to reach out to others in need. Amen. Thank you, Eric. So just a few quick announcements. Um, <clears throat> this week, during the week, everything is still on, uh, except uh, Allison is away on vacation, so Rosie Ward will be taking over the Tuesday coffee time. So we look forward to uh, everybody having a good time with Rosie. And um, Paul will actually be back as host this Sunday, or rather this Thursday, even though he's on a kind of working vacation out in BC. Um, I have some good news to tell you about the music committee. Um, we have been uh, searching for uh, uh, candidates as our music director, and we've put ads out into various publications. And frankly, we have received so many great applications that we've decided to uh, shorten the application period, and it will end by March 31st. Um, this is just because we have an embarrassment of riches of wonderful candidates and we want to get going with the interview process. So if you know of anybody who was thinking of applying, now is the time to apply because we won't be accepting applications after March 31st. Um, coming up on April 3rd, I'm going to be uh, providing a um, sort of, I'll be your tour guide on a walk uh, across St. Clair from Timothy Eden Memorial Church all the way to Young Street as various churches along the way have modern art devoted to the stages of the cross, particularly um, Jesus' walk to the cross. Um, this is part of a uh, program called Crossings, and there's also another bunch of art stations down uh, on the U of T campus. But I thought, we're in North Toronto, so we should do the North Toronto part. Um, this will be at 2 o'clock on April 3rd, which is Sunday after the service, and we'll meet at Timothy Memorial Church. And um, anybody who is happy to walk for an hour, an hour and a half uh, is welcome to come. Uh, just dress in some comfortable shoes, and we'll stop and start. And if we're smart, we'll stop for coffee somewhere, too. Um, and then to get you ready for that, whether you come or not, of course, we do have Good Friday and Easter coming up. I'm going to be doing a Bible for Busy People um, in a couple of days before that on uh, March 30th, right, which is a Wednesday night on April 1st um, at 10 a.m. And we're going to be just looking at the Gospel of Mark from the Last Supper to Jesus' last breath on the cross. So uh, we'll be reading the text together, and it'll give us a lot of time to talk about it. You know, we hear these texts during our Good Friday service, but we don't get to go, wait, I, I don't get that part. I don't understand what that means. This is your chance to ask as many questions as possible. And then with that in mind, for those of you who want to come on the Crossings Walk, you'll have a sort of richer background when you see these art pieces, which are all modern art pieces, which are riffing off of those, um, those events in the, in the Bible. Um, also, next Sunday after the service, the Affirm Committee will be meeting um, to discuss our May 1st uh, big celebration of us becoming an affirming congregation. Kathleen Wynn, Premier Kathleen Wynn, will be our uh, speaker. Um, so it's going to be quite the celebration on May 1st, and there's some planning to be done, and there'll be a barbecue held afterwards. So uh, it'll be a lot of fun. 
Um, so we need to plan that, so we're gonna have a meeting after uh, next Sunday's service. Also, uh, this Sunday, today at two o'clock, um, I'm gonna be going down to Nathan Phillips Square where there is a march happening for migrant workers. 1.6 million people work as migrant workers in Canada each year, most of them are racialized, and they are treated by the Canadian government as yo-yos, being allowed to stay for a few months and then having to go back home, allowed to stay for a few months, going back home. They really got us through uh, the pandemic in many ways, they're essential workers, and yet they don't have a whole lot of rights. Um, there'll be a march from, this is truly a march, from Nathan Phillips Square for 1.6 kilometers to um, recognize the 1.6 million people who work as migrant workers in this country. If you'd like to go to that, um, just send me an email and maybe we can meet up. Finally, um, if uh, you would like to provide a donation to this church, we are always happy to receive them. It costs money to keep this beautiful building uh, afloat. And we have two schools here, a school for autistic children upstairs, and uh, preschool in the, in the basement, and all sorts of community groups use this building. It's really a de facto community center, and it does need money to run. So if you'd like to make a donation, you can make a one-time donation by um, sending money to this email address on the screen, or if you want to do it monthly, you can sign up with Michael Larkin, and he'll talk you, uh, and talk you through how to get the money deducted from your bank account every month. Finally, if you'd like to contact me, this is my email address. Many of you have been doing this and I really love it, so just let me know and I will happily talk to you. So those are our announcements for this week. Um, thanks very much for coming in person as well as at home this morning. And now it's time for our final hymn, where this being a service about sin, we thought we would end on a high note with Amazing Grace. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe camera three. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we'll figure this out, folks. So, go now into this world with kind and daring hearts. Go in peace. The world is waiting. It's not waiting for perfect people. It's not waiting for people who don't sin. Don't worry, you will. In your head and in your acts, you will make mistakes. 
But we follow one who said, I will forgive your sins. Be in relationship with me. And through that, you will feel love coursing inside of you, a love which comes from above and which you can share with the world. May the love of God and the grace of this and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.